this is SP. Welcome to Powerful Impact. Today we have Dr. Akita DeRowan. I've got it. You did. Thank Yay! you. It's not very common, so I appreciate the effort. But it's very pretty. Thank it's a you. very pretty name. Um, she is here. She is a triple board certified physician. I am so happy to have her here. I have so we have so many questions, especially with all the Michigas that's going on right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, can you tell? Just give everybody a little background about where you're from. Sure. So, as it was stated, my name is Urquita DeRowan. I am a doctor who is board certified in family medicine diversity medicine and lifestyle medicine. I live in the DC area and I've been practicing for goodness, I guess a decade now I'm getting up there. And um, right now I'm working in the telehealth space. I work with telemedicine. I also do some consulting and I do public speaking and I host a weekly podcast geared towards helping pre-meds and med students get into medical school, as well as covering some hot topics in medicine. A lot. (laughs) You are busy. (laughs) I guess we're all just trying to keep busy and keep sane around here. Absolutely. You got to keep your hands moving because I don't like to be idle. (laughs) So I know you're in D.C. now, but where are you originally from? And how does that impact the way you practice medicine? Sure. So I am originally from this area, from the D.C. area. So I live in Maryland in PG County, about 10 minutes outside of D.C. Um, Both of my parents are from the the city, from D.C., and a lot of our family is here. from both sides, my mom's side of the family is originally from North Carolina, and my dad's side of the family is from Louisiana. So we have a lot of the South going on. And how that it helps me kind of impact medicine, it, it does have a great impact because being from a metropolitan area and having a lot of family members who live directly in the city um, and being a doctor of color, being a Black woman, we have a lot of healthcare disparities, which I'm sure you guys have heard about ad nauseum, especially after the pandemic and uh, all of the different things that have been going on with George Floyd and us trying to work to get more health equity. But um, since I was a girl, I noticed the disparities in people who have underserved healthcare in inner cities and things like that. And I've always been passionate about kind of addressing those and kind of decreasing those disparities. So when I went to college, I went to Hampton University, which is a historically black college and university and learned all about how, of course, black people are not a monolith. So learned a lot about different cultures within the African-American community. And then when I was in college, I was accepted into an early med school selection program where I did my senior year and some summers at Boston University. And I ended up kind of matriculating into there for medical school. So trained in Boston in an inner city for um, medical school and learned all about like all of the diverse populations there, which are a little different than uh, DC. And it was really great to learn about people from all of the different cultures and how we could help them and help decrease disparities. And then when I went to residency, I came home and I did training in Baltimore which is another inner city with a lot of disparities where there are differences in life expectancy within like two blocks of one another. So black people in Baltimore, if you live in one area, your life expectancy is in the fifties and I'm not exaggerating. And if you move 10 minutes down the road to like Roland park, it can be eighties. So there's tremendous disparities. I've always had an interest in that. So after medical school, I in residency, I decided to work in underserved health clinics. So community health clinics where there's a lot of um, 
of course, underserved care for people without insurance, people who live in the inner city, people who are undocumented and need health care, as well as people who are in um, communities where there are a lot of um, judgment. So like the LGBT community and the HIV community. So I did a lot of work in those communities. And after a few years practicing there, I learned so much and I I felt like it was kind of getting to me because you you know how to treat people and you want to help them get better and you're trying to like pull at all of these resources, but sometimes you can't help as much as you would like to just given the way that our healthcare system works. So there would be patients who need a dialysis and you know, like, okay, I can refer you to dialysis down the street, but they didn't have insurance. So we would have to send them to the ER three times a week and they would have these huge bills or we had children who had asthma, but um, they, their parents couldn't afford like the, the um, asthma machine. So I was using money from my own pocket because I wanted to give them to that. So it wasn't sustainable. So I looked into other ways in order to impact populations from a higher level. So I decided to transition into telemedicine, um, kind of before it was cool. So about four or five years ago, and everyone's like, what's that? That's not real medicine. Like, don't do that. Um, but it, I've learned so much in there, and I've grown in leadership. And I actually have a book coming out in October about um, telemedicine sponsored by the Mayo Clinic that um, kind of talks about how women can help navigate themselves through care with telemedicine. And there are a whole bunch of other chapters by other doctors in it um, where you can kind of learn about how to approach different healthcare issues. So I've been definitely working in the telehealth space to kind of create help increase equity here, as well as working to speak with different organizations and things about how that they can make things more equitable for where they are, for their employees, and for the patients that they serve. Yeah, in the telehealth field, um, I mean, everything's got, you know, a pro and a con. Like, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I mean, you know, you obviously some of it's, you, you, you're, you've named some of the stuff that you enjoy doing in that, but um, like, can you go in further on, on like the great things about telehealth and maybe some of the stuff that's not so, um, I don't know, glamorous or whatever. Absolutely. So I, I definitely am a firm believer that telemedicine does not replace in-person care at all. As someone who's practiced full-time telemedicine for the past four years or so, I think that telemedicine is awesome for access to care because there are so many people um, who may be waiting like months to see a doctor or they may be in the ICU and they may need, they may have certain people, nurses or physician's assistants and things there in the hospital with them, but they may need an overseeing doctor who may be covering multiple hospitals to give them care and make sure that they're getting the right things that they need. There may be something simple like having a UTI or just needing a refill on your blood pressure medicine when you have a blood pressure cuff at home that you can kind of communicate with your doctor. So it creates that ease of access. So we've had many patients call in and they're like, oh my goodness, this has changed my life because I haven't been able to get my blood pressure under control because I can't make a doctor's appointment because I work the night shift and I have kids. So now they're able to come into some of these companies and get their lives back on track. Or it may help in different ways from the physician kind of connecting with the patient because I notice doing primary care in person, you're in your best behavior when you go to the doctor, hopefully. So you, 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 you're like, okay, I got to take a nice shower. I got to smell nice. I got to be like, yes, doctor, yes, but you may not ask the questions that you need, or you may feel rushed because I'm sure people who are listening have experienced that the healthcare system is a little uh, chaotic. So sometimes you may not have as much time in the doctor's room as you or the doctor would like, and it may be out of both of you guys' hands. So you may feel rushed and not be able to ask about if you have diabetes, what kinds of things you should eat. Or you may say, yeah, I'm eating well, but when you're in a telehealth space, they can say, okay, bring your phone over to your refrigerator. Let me see what you've been eating. And it may open a lot of things. And you're like, okay, I have these Cheetos in here and this soda. Maybe I should cut that back. And, you, and that may not have come up in the in-person visit. So it may be a little more personal because you're talking to them from your home. Right. Some of the things that are 
may be a little negative or may need some help from in-person care is it doesn't cover all things. Like, of course, with medicine, about 70% of diagnoses and things like that can be done by just listening and getting that history. So it's all about that story of how you present yourselves. And it says that a lot in the book of like, you need to know what medicines you're on, when it started, why it started, like give them as much information. Like don't assume that they're no, don't just be like, yeah, it hurts. Like tell them how it feels. It feels like something is stabbing me in the stomach and it comes and goes every 20 minutes. Cause that can help them kind of think through the potential different diseases and how they are a little different and help you kind of narrow down on something. So 70% of it is a story and you can do that hopefully through telemedicine. But there are some cases where you do need to go in person. You do need someone to touch your belly. You do need someone at least once a year, even if you have hypertension and it's controlled, to listen to your heart, to to kind of feel your, your pulses and make sure everything is kind of going well because you don't want to make those assumptions. Even with simple things like dermatology, some patients may get upset and they're like, I'm just sending you a picture. Yes, you'll send me a picture of what you can see. But when you go into the doctor for your yearly physical or something like that, they can look on your back and they'll be like, what's that new mole? And you want someone to have that eye on you so you won't just be narrow minded on what you think is going on. So you can figure out and kind of prevent missing things. So I'm a big uh, fan of doctors on demand. Mm -hmm. Love it. (laughs) A lot. They're a great company. <laughs> well, that's because that's what's my what my insurance covers. Mm-hmm. So, but I find that it is so helpful, especially when you have something like a cold or something like that. Yeah. You, you know what it is. You just you know don't want to go into the doctor's office and sit there for two hours feeling bad. Mm-hmm. So. I I find telemedicine to be just perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I wanted to ask you because um, I'm a nurse. So Mm -hmm. I work in the in the medical field and I see a lot of times the disparity um, in health care. What what are they doing now? What are they are they? Um, doing now t- in order to change what's happening with the disparities in healthcare? That is a great question. And I think that it's a loaded question because as we discussed a little earlier, we know that there have been a lot of initiatives that have been pushed out over the past two years mm-hmm. since they kind of highlighted with the pandemic with all of the healthcare disparities. But we have so much history of inequity that it's not going to change overnight. So a lot of times we may blame, we meaning us healthcare providers like, oh, they just uh, distrust the system. We can't keep doing that. Like, of course, there is distrust because there's been like systemic racism over years. There's been experimentation on Black people, not just with the things that we know about with like the Tuskegee um, experiments and things, but there have been hundreds of years of experiments. So it's not gonna go over go over way overnight. But now we have this platform where there's an eye on it. There have been changes where they have looked and they said, okay, yes, the renal numbers and things like that, where they decipher, okay, if you're a white person, your numbers, your creatinine clearance and stuff should be one thing. And if you're African-American, it's higher because we have higher muscle mass and stuff. So that's been disproved. So things like that, that were kind of putting Black people at a disadvantage where if you need a certain amount of the number to get a kidney transplant or to get more medications and stuff, Black people were getting it later when it wasn't even a difference. So there have been a lot of advocacy to change a lot of that, and that's been moving forward. But now we have to work on a lot of different things like having patients advocate for themselves, knowing what questions to ask, knowing when something is looking wrong. So like you said, you use telemedicine a lot for like your colds and things. That's okay. And as a telemedicine provider, like I'm excited that you use that. But we have to let people know like the systems don't communicate. 
So you know that if you go to the urgent care versus going to your primary, we wouldn't know. So if you're going to these extra companies like Doctors on Demand, they have no, your doctor has no idea you've gone there. They don't know if you started a new medicine. If you've gone there four times over the past two months and seeing different doctors, there's no continuity. So if you were seeing your primary care, they may say, okay, you've seen us four times for this. It might not be that, like, let's get an x-ray, let's get some CT scan, let's have you see a pulmonologist. But because they have no idea, those things might be delayed. So that's why I always recommend that, like, yes, it's great to see telemedicine providers, but keep your doctor abreast of what's going on. So say, hey, I wasn't feeling good. I went to Doctors on Demand last week. They gave me some um, prednisone, just send them a little message. So they'll know and be able to put that in your note or something like that. So, so there are so many ways that we can kind of work on advocating for ourselves, um, but there are some way, things that the, the healthcare systems and the medical associations are going to have to push even further on. So we have, uh, we all have the, the primary care physicians, but we also have cardiologists and nephrologists and all of, all of this stuff. So my question is because I, I did home health for so long just in general which doctor do you need to make sure all of your medications are going through first because i i know that a lot of the car, the cardio medicine the cardiac medicine interacts with everything mm -hmm. so when you are because I've, I've gone home so many times where i've seen patients who had so many different medications and all of them were counteracting the other because of the way they work so which medications which doctor should be abreast of all of your medications at one time to make sure that there isn't um, polypharmacy or uh, contradiction in medications? That's a really good question. And I think it starts with your primary care. They're supposed to be like home base where they kind of advocate for you and communicate with your other specialists. Of course, we definitely need specialists. Like if you need a cardiologist, cardiologist probably has the, the last say and they have more information as to what's going on with your body and why they put you on that medicine. But you should always tell your primary care so they can get a note from that specialist. And then also they'll know what other medicines you're on from the other doctors or from them where they can kind of look and say, hey, there's an interaction. Or if they see an issue with it, they can reach out to the cardiologist and be like, did you know they were on this medicine? It may interact with that. Are you still cool with them going with that? Have you seen the, any problems with patients who's been on both? Because the cardiologist is, is most of the time just looking at their part of the body. So they may not really think about like, oh, this person is on an antidepressant or this person is on this. And a lot of times they do. I'm not saying that they don't, but it may be good to have that second pair of eyes thinking about your whole body as opposed to just that one body system. You mentioned um, a book that you got coming out, mm -hmm. uh, but you have more than one, right? Like there's, yes. a, there's another, can you talk about those? Just, just give a, and, and then where people can find them. Sure, I will send you the link. Um, the first one is called Medicine, Women, and Anthology System of Women in Healthcare. And that one came out last year. It is um, basically a book of stories of women in healthcare. So physicians and nurses and physician assistants and nurse practitioners from all over the world who just share their stories of a way where healthcare impacted them or their lives or they write a letter to someone who may be reading this, like in terms of like the audience of a future physician or a letter to your younger selves on something you have learned as you've grown. So in my chapter, I have a letter to future Black female physicians, and it just talks about my story of how I became a physician and all of the hurdles that kind of came up um, some of them with racism in medicine, in the healthcare system, and with my training, and how I kind of overcame them and came into my own and kind of got out of that imposter syndrome phase. 
So that was a, a really fun book and it, it's really good. And a lot of the other offers have some amazing stories. And then the upcoming one, I will get the title to you guys. I'll email it to you because it's still in production. But it is called, I think when women listen, it comes out in October. So we'll have a final title. But it's a number of, I think about 70 or 80 docs who come together in their different specialties. So an OBGYN is writing about how women can approach women's health. There's an orthopedic surgeon talking about like, what happens when you have knee injuries and stuff like that. And it talks just like as like we're regular people, not all of that medical jargon. And it it tells you key things like, OK, when you have this pain, ask these questions. So it's kind of kind of building up like you were saying, like, how can you know what to ask and how to advocate for yourself in those types of things? So in my chapter, I tackle telemedicine. So it talks about how to approach a telemedicine visit, what you should have ready for yourself, and kind of how we were talking about how it should be used as a companion to in-person care. So what types of things to bring back to your primary care doctor. So it was a really fun chapter, and it just talked about like how we can maximize that telehealth. Is there any correlation between those books and the, and the podcast you, you do? So um, the podcast I do is a little different. I have had some episodes, um, of course, on racism in medicine, where I shared a little bit about my story. And I had an episode where someone interviewed me, our former host, um, and talked about telemedicine and telehealth. But I've been doing it for about the past year and a half, and it's called The Perspective Doctor. And it focuses on helping pre-med students and med students figure out how to navigate getting into medical school, how to conquer those interviews, how to fill out the applications, what schools are looking for, those kinds of things. As well as once you're in medical school, it goes through and I'll interview people from all different specialties and you can kind of learn like what it's like to be an anesthesiologist, what it's like to be an OBGYN and things like that so that they can have an idea of things they may be wanting to go into. And it also, I'll ask the doctors about what they're doing. And there are people who are doing really cool things. Like there was an anesthesiologist who noticed that there was an underserved area that he was serving and children were waiting two years to get dental procedures because there weren't enough anesthesiologists. So he decided to start a mobile anesthesia clinic and go out and help those kids get their surgeries. And now the wait time is less than three months. Um, so there are a lot of different cool stories. And we, of course, we talk about the hot topics in medicine. So we've had epidemiologists come and talk about COVID. We had people come and talk about how to stay safe and in all of these kinds of things. And even certain people who come on and coach people on how to stay well, what lifestyle medicine is. I've even had an intimacy coach come on because people who are in medicine have higher levels of divorce. So she talked about, um, different ways into how she coaches people to stay true to themselves and how to incorporate their relationship while going through school and being so busy with medicine. Okay. So we're talking about uh, the anesthesiologist and all, mm -hmm. of, all, all of that. And I am thinking a lot about um, especially here in Texas when we go into the emergency rooms it is texas has the largest population of black people in this state in the u.s and quite often when you go into the emergency rooms there are no black people in the emergency room Mm -hmm. I find that quite often because now I do travel nursing that we tend to get the shit jobs. <laughs> I does, does that happen um, for doctors also? Yes, I could talk days and days and days about this, honestly. Um, black people make up 5% of physicians total. So that number has been the same since the 1970s. So black men have made up 2% and black women have made up three since the 70s. 
until about this year, there's been an increase in matriculation. I think some might have been there thinking some of the cause and effect of the pandemic and all of that. So hopefully these students can get out <laughs> and, and go and serve the place. But what I always say is we're working hard to increase, but it, it is a small number and Latinx make, people make up, up another 5%. And there's even a smaller amount of indigenous people who make up healthcare provider, healthcare doctors. So our big thing is we are not going to have black people in every place treating people. There have been studies that show that black people actually do better when cared by another black person, but that's not something that we can do. So what we have to do is to work on creating allies. So there are so many physicians who hopefully have gone into this for a reason, especially in this newer generation, who are open to becoming more culturally competent and learning more things and learning how, unlearning all of the things that they have ingrained in us, even Black physicians, as we talked about how my whole training, I've been practicing for 10 years and up until last year when they took away the renal numbers, I believed it that, okay, you're black, you get a little more numbers because that's what is in the healthcare books. So we're unlearning some of that racism that has been ingrained in medicine over years and years and years. So we have to keep fighting and keep calling people out and keep educating people on how to be more competent. And then we have to work to help our patients also understand what they should be looking out for as well, because sometimes people are gaslit and kind of so, oh, don't worry about it, or oh, it's just this, or or they don't know. Or I even saw an Instagram yesterday, and I know that's not like a valid source, <laughs> but I saw an Instagram yesterday, there was a black nurse who worked on the L and D, the labor and delivery unit. Mm -hmm. And she was telling a story about how we have to get more culturally competent because she came in and you know how you get report from what happened during the day. So she came in and the nurse, the white nurse was telling her about what had happened during the day. And there was this lady in there and she had called a psych consult on her because she said she kept hitting herself in the head and she had the baby in there. So she's like, something's wrong with this lady. So the black nurse is like, she was hitting herself in the head. Was it like this? And she said, yeah. She was like, did she have like braids or a weave? And she was like, yeah, she did. How did you know? She's like, when black people have a weave or braids and they can't get to their scalp, they tap their head to scratch it. And the lady was like, oh my God, I called psych on her. She might, so she's like, I'll cancel that. So just little things like that and being more competent can definitely create a better experience for our patients. Because imagine if, psychiatry did go in there and she's hitting her head and they want to take her baby or something like that. So we just have to work to continue to educate people. I think that it's changed a lot um, of people's opinions as we talk about it more because, you know, there, racism is something we used to brush under the rug and just say it's something we got to deal with or, you know, but now that we're talking about it more, even our, our white allies are more cognizant about what's going on. One of my best friends from residency is white. And after all of the George Floyd stuff and all of the things that have been in healthcare over the past year, she's been checking herself. And I, I personally think she's an awesome doctor, but you know, stuff gets in your head. So she'll text me and she'll be like, I did this for this patient. Like, was that okay? Like, or I said, I'm like, yeah, you're good. <laughs> so they apparently have group chats now where they're like, okay, I'm checking my bias. Like, so I, I say do more of that. And I think, uh, quite often we we do get tired mm -hmm. you do get tired but um i think when people are asking valid questions to kind of brush them off and tell them to go google it is mm -hmm. is kind of uh no win for for us you know just as a people sometimes you're, you're going to have to explain it because if somebody was inquisitive enough to even ask the question in the first place meant 
they really didn't know and wanted information. So kudos to her that she even realized it or noticed it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, everyone's, like you said, becoming a little more um, aware, but on, on like an administration level, how how does that work inside of um, inside of hospitals and, and clinics and things as far as um, making sure physicians and nurses and um, just everyone that works there is, you know, you, know, you can get aware of, of, of different cultures and the trainings and things. Like I know that, you know, some trainings are just, they're bare minimum and mm -hmm. they barely cover anything. And, you know, um, so I don't know if those have changed at all or if they're improving or getting worse. I mean, what do, what do you think on that? So I think you're as strong as your leadership is. So all over the country is going to be a disparity as to how intense and how intentional leadership wants to be in order to enforce these things. So if you have someone that is kind of nonchalant about decreasing health disparities, they're going to just have you do a little click through to say that you met your requirements. Um, I think that people have to ask for it more. People have to stick up for it more. It can't just be the black providers, because as we just talked about, there are so many, so little, and there are so many patients, everyone has to want to desire to learn more. There are some initiatives from like the American Medical Association and different medical boards that now require for you to keep your licensure that you do certain courses. Most of them are online and some of them are click through, but something to kind of stay abreast on those topics of cultural competency and things like that. Um, and how to decrease health disparities. But I think we just have to keep pushing for more and keep calling people out when they're not doing it because you can make a change. I remember when I was in medical school, we had a dean who was not so uh, discreet with mm -hmm. her feelings about Black people. Um, and there was a big report that came out and she had quotes and she was not culturally competent. So the black center, we called her out on it, even though she was a dean of the medical school. And out of that, we were able to create a working group where we integrated cultural competency into the first two years of medical school as training and coursework for the students that is required to do. And when I visited the school about two years ago and talked to the students, they're still doing it. So some small changes that you might advocate for yourself can have lingering effects. So if people just keep pushing and keep moving forward, there'll be more questions and more things and, and people will want to learn more. And I know just personally, as a person who speaks to organizations about cultural competency and decreasing healthcare disparities, there are so many people that want to learn. So more, at least in the tech world, health tech, a lot of people are reaching out to learn more and they're having this access with the Zoom meetings where they want to talk about these things and they mm -hmm. want to give you space. Um, so we just have to push for more organizations to do that. It's a little harder in the brick and mortar healthcare because it's a little more, um, We've always done it this way kind of mentality a lot of times. So that's why I said it kind of goes back to what the foundations of your leadership are. But as leadership changes and as people grow, and even if your leadership isn't changing, if you advocate it for it as a unit, if you are listening to this and you're like, we haven't had any cultural competency talks in our job. And it's this talk with your groups and talk about like, hey, how can we make this a better place? Like, how can we incorporate for these things? How can we get speakers out? How can we get these resources? Because you deserve it and you will see a change in the outcomes of your patients if you treat them better. Yeah, I um, I remember taking care of a patient who, when I worked hospice, mm -hmm. <laughs> that they, they had to be on, on the floor because it was just a part of their culture that they were, mm -hmm. when they died, they needed to be on the floor. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember them calling to have uh, adult protective services yeah. to come and make them put the patient in the bed. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. 
So when we have these cultural, when we have these cultural questions, Mm -hmm. do you have any place that you, you, you specifically go where you can learn about, um, the different cultures, especially with, um, with just cultural norms like not mm-hmm. looking people in not looking people in the eye and, <laughs> you yeah. know these cultural norms that is considered um taboo in some cultures and we just have no knowledge of them that's a great question so there there are lots of resources on different cultures and what certain basic things like, okay, what people feed their babies and things like that. And it's kind of dependent on what that culture is, what that topic is. Like there could be like, I don't think it is even realistic to just tell people a whole bunch of lists of books. There is one website that definitely goes into bias and cultural differences. I, I put it in our chat, but it's raceandmedicine.com. But I think at the very basic, a lot of this goes back to communication. So the reason that I'm assuming that you know that this person had this this uh, belief and they had to stay on the floor is because you probably asked them, why are you on the floor? And they told you. So just being inquisitive and respectful, like not, you know, why are you on the floor? You need to get up. But say, I'm very curious. You've been on the floor. Like, we have a bed. Is it not comfortable? Like, why why do you prefer the floor? And, and you'll get that answer. So I, I've, there are so many different cultures, so it's, it's kind of hard to kind of put it in one book or one website. Mm-hmm. So just ask those questions. Like I remember when I was in residency, I had a patient who, I forgot what illness she had, but she always talked about mermaids. And she was talking about swimming and seeing mermaids. And I was like, is this lady okay? <laughs> so <laughs> I was almost to the point like that nurse who was talking about somebody beating in their head. But I asked her like what what is going on so she she was from a country that highly esteemed mermaids and it helped her kind of stay calm and stuff but then i looked it up and then there were all these mythologies about mermaids so she wasn't crazy it just wasn't a belief that i had but if you ask people you learn more Um, led you in the direction of the specialties that you you've chosen because i think they're wonderful because so many people kind of forget about the necessity, especially mm-hmm. as a, a black woman, to even learn about our culture because there's so much diversity in each of our cultures. Yes. Even though they consider us a monolith, we are not. Absolutely. Um, in terms of my specialties, my first board certification is family medicine. It's one of those traditional specialties where you have to choose in medical school. And when I went into medical school, I'd always thought that I wanted to pursue primary care kind of for the reasons where we talked about a little earlier about my family's exposure and things in inner city. I I always said, I want to go back home and work in the community clinic and, and help my people. Um, And I love conversations and I love learning about people. And I think as a family doctor, aside from, you know, a lot of the things you can have five people come in with diabetes in the day and another six with hypertension and then something random that will mix up the day. So after a few years, you kind of get the medicine component, even though each person is different and they are they'll deal with their disease process differently. So you also can't treat people as a number. You have to Their visit is the only visit to you for the day for them, even though you may have 20 visits. So I love the science of it and that kind of stuff, but I also love engaging in people and and talking. And when I was in medical school, I had an attending, which is a supervising physician. Um, They had a technique in their clinic where they called it, they were an OBGYN, so they only had female physicians. They called it homegirl time. So they would one they would pick one topic of the day and ask every patient the same question and see how they responded to it. So I remember one time when uh, Kate and William got married from the Royals, 
we had the magazine in the lobby. So everybody, we were like, what do you think about the dress? And it was so cool to hear like everybody's thoughts. So I like to incorporate that. And I chose family medicine to kind of see people from birth to death and, and kind of help them through that process and their whole families. But as time has evolved, and I told you guys that I transitioned from seeing patients in the traditional manner, I wanted to learn more about how to keep us healthy. I was a family doctor. I'm like, okay, I know the basics, exercise, drink water, take your medicines if you got to take them. We're, the goal is to get you off the medicines and everything in between. But what they don't teach us in medicine is a lot about in detail about like nutrition and exercise and sleep and all of those kinds of things. So I wanted to learn more to help not only my patients, but myself, my family members who come and call and ask questions all of the time. So I decided to pursue another certification in lifestyle medicine, and it's been quite helpful. I'm thinking about even expanding that to work on coaching patients through um how to get back on track with their lives, as well as like you were talking about, a lot of people don't know how to advocate for themselves. So there's something called physician advocates or coaching. So you guys check out my website. It might be coming soon to reach out for that. But um, that's www.drdrkeda.com. But that's why I went into lifestyle medicine. And then my third one is diversity medicine. So over the past few years, I have been working with my passion of, of decreasing these disparities, as we talked about. And I have that experience of working in community health and the underserved areas, as well as working to advocate with our organizations and things like that about decreasing health disparities. So I thought that it would be very pertinent <laughs> to have evidence to back that up. So I decided to pursue a certificate in um, diversity medicine. And last year I obtained my board certification in that. And I think that it's definitely helped me, like you said, explore other cultures and learn other things because there were assignments where you had to kind of learn about more about transgender patients or LGBT or patients with different cultural things that are going on and things like that. So it kind of gives you a full spectrum instead of being in your one-sided bubble. So my favorite thing in the world is to work with with the migrant workers. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to different populations, we have these, um, people have these set biases. Um, how do you, first, how can a, per, how can a patient see those biases and know when it's time to move on? Because mm -hmm. there's so often that people will stay with the doctor because they're the doctor without acknowledging that, but you're the consumer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is your body, your life. You have, a, you have the right to choose and it's not just who you're assigned to. You have the right to find a doctor who understands and meshes with you. How do we teach people to see that and understand that um, some choices are are theirs and they have to be proactive? Absolutely. I'm a firm believer that all choices are theirs, whether or not you accept medication and all of that. To me, doctor means teacher. So I've had all of these years of training to help teach you what is recommended for you. It's up to you to decide if you want to accept that. Now, that's a little different with kids because they don't really have a choice. But for adult patients, it's your choice. If, if you have diabetes and I give you the options of what to do, diet, exercise, and medication, you might have a number that requires insulin. And you may, we may strongly recommend that. But if you're not at that point where you want to try insulin, that's okay. Like we can work on it. We can one, dig into why not. 
two, dig into the other alternatives in terms of what we can try, and then maybe come back in three or four months and see, okay, how has this worked? How have your numbers improved? How has this worked? Okay, you want to try that insulin again? Why not? Maybe we could talk you into it. But it's always about yourself and, and what you're comfortable with. On top of that, seeing a provider, like you said, is a choice. So a lot of times, I think that going to find doctors I, I, is like dating. So everyone, you got to see where you, who you vibe with and, and all of those kinds of things. And, and if there isn't a connect, if they aren't explaining things well, you can kind of advocate for yourself and say, hey, can you tell me this a different way? Or do you have another resource? Um, I'm not a, a, a reading a document type of person. If they print out something, can you re recommend that I look at a YouTube video or something like that? But if it becomes a pattern and you're not comfortable, it's always okay to get a second opinion. Sometimes um, it may be difficult, depending on where you live. If you live in more of a rural area or if you're seeing a specialist, that there may not be a lot of those types of specialists. Like if you have a liver issue and there aren't a lot of hepatologists in the area, you might have to see them. <laughs> but if, if it's something like primary care or a therapist or something like that, there are usually more than one option. So it's okay to go and try to get a second opinion or even tell the doctor or, or ask around in different communities as to where people are going and things like that. So I just quit my doctor today. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it it had become a circus to just get a physical. I, mm -hmm. I've had the physical mm -hmm. four times and still haven't gotten the physical paperwork back. Mm -hmm. But every time I go back, they're like, you have to do a physical because it's been so long since the last time. I was like, you know what? I just quit. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about doing another physical on me. So I, I, I think that takes a certain amount of knowledge and power to talk to um, people who you know are educated in your health. And I've been with this doctor for almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. So when you, how do you empower people? Because we can tell them it's okay to do this. But that, that takes a certain amount of empowerment, especially uh, a level of empowerment that we um, haven't had in just as a culture. We just normally don't have just in even in our own communities. Okay. First of all, I think that it's I'm a strong believer in expectation setting on both sides. So if you are wanting a physical, and physical is a word that I actually hate, but well, that's a whole other thing. It's like, what is a physical? But um, you're wanting a health maintenance exam for screening. That's usually what, uh, what we consider a physical. Typically, they can't address other issues. So if you have high blood pressure or something like that, need medication refills, all of those kinds of things, that is typically not a part of a physical. And that goes into like health insurance and medical billing and coverage. And then how much time you have in the room. It's all of these kind of administrative things that have nothing to do with medicine, to be honest. So a lot of times people will get frustrated because they're like, I came in for a physical, blah, blah, blah. So I like to always tell my patients when I was in person, like, a physical is this, like, let's deal with your blood pressure and stuff. So then you come back in two weeks and we can go through all the screening or I can order the labs now and then we come back and do it. But so that was probably a communication error that your doctor didn't do or something like that. But also from you, um, I'm not sure if you said like the on the first time, like, I really need this form filled out, blah, 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 blah. So, so communication. But if it gets to that point where you guys are not in alignment, you said you went back four times. That's I, I personally would have been like, okay, let's try to add on the physical and not put it on the code. <laughs> but but um, yeah, it's kind of plus or minuses, and it depends on the billing and the administration. But looking into other times, like I said, like it's more like you said about advocating for yourself. So 
No one cares about you more than you care about you. As your doctor, of course, I care about you. I'm rooting for you. Yes. But you are living your life every day and you have to be healthy and well and feel comfortable. And you're paying your, your money and your time to go there and your lifetime as well because you're trying to get better. So if you're not OK with that, then that comes to a point where you need to start researching, OK, what doctor my friends go to? What doctor my family members go to? Y'all like them? Looking into other models, sometimes there's a barrier with healthcare insurance and depending on what clinic you go to, you may get different care, but sometimes people like to go to direct primary care is a new thing that is popping up. I don't know if you guys have heard it, but some doctors are leaving the corporate medicine, which is kind of mostly hospital owned. And they're opening their own practices where they can set their own time. They can set how many patients they have on a panel. So a lot of times patients may, doctors may have like 5,000, 8,000 patients that they see yearly. Um, and if you divide that up, if people are coming multiple times in, in a month, it's a lot of patients. So it's, it can get unmanageable, but it's determined by your administration, how many patients you see and how long you see them for. So with DPC, some doctors are like, okay, my panel is going to be 500 patients. I'm going to see them for this cost, take out the middleman of insurance, negotiate with the getting the blood work with the lab and stuff like that with certain fees so that I can see my patients for an hour at a time and, and things like that. So a lot of those are popping up. So that may be something that people may want to look at if they want a more personalized primary care. Sometimes it may be cost prohibitive, but a lot of times with a lot of the DPC clinics, when you take out that middleman, it can actually be kind of cheaper. They'll do like a yearly fee or sometimes for families or people who may be uninsured or underinsured, they can do a tiered like scheduling system for payment. I'm gonna take you back on the physicals thing. <laughs> because I'm curious, Word. I'm, I'm curious about about what you're going going for over there. Because you can you break that down in terms of what what because uh, you said you don't like the word physical. So like what like what what would you can uh, yeah, I like the word yeah like oh. and then and then what would like like you called it health maintenance or or whatever um like how would you break that down and what that is or to, pe okay. to people the reason I don't enjoy the word physical um, is because every visit is technically like a physical exam because they're examining a physical part of your body and they're addressing one of your issues for health. So when you come in and you're like, check everything, there are certain things that are recommended to be checked at your age. So if you're a woman in your 20s, versus 30s versus 40s, I have a different mental checklist of what I should be checking on you for your physical or health maintenance exam. So when you come in for the physical exam, you're supposed to just be kind of getting them prepped and making sure that everything is good for prevention, preventative care, not the active things that are going on. So if you are 30 years old and you come in for a physical exam, I'm gonna say, okay, when was the last time your cholesterol was checked? Do we Have we checked your um, hemoglobin and things to see your CBC to see if you complete blood count to see if you have anemia or something going on. Um, have you been gaining weight? Oh my goodness. I look, I have time to actually look at your trend of your weight over the past year is going up. Let's check your thyroid to make sure that there's nothing going on with that. How has your diet been? We have time to talk about that. How has your mental health been? I might ask you a little questionnaire to see um, if you've been feeling sad or things like that, do you, okay, you're 30, um, I'm going to do your breast exam and your pap. Do you, um, have you had an abnormal pap before? Have you had any breast cancer in your family? Yes, you have. What age were they? Oh, they were within 10 years of your age. We need to do a mammogram early. So you're able to pay more attention to what they are doing to look at the whole body and kind of figure out what they're needing to set them up for the next year. You take off 
this is the time where you, hopefully you're in a gown for your physical because a lot of times they don't put you in one, but they look at you and they do your skin screen so they can look at your back and say, oh, that's a new mold. Keep an eye on that and have someone take a picture of it for you cause, and see if it grows. We'll look at it in the next couple of months or you, you text me, you send me something in the portal if you notice a difference. So all of those things they can kind of go through to see when you're well, it's kind of like your well person exam, kind of like when there's a baby or a child. And for those first few years, they go every couple of months, depending on their age and kind of even if because they're well, but you want to say, OK, it's time for this shot. It's time for this. They're growing. So kind of like a, a checkup, kind of like when you go and get your oil changed at the car shop. I see there's a question about why are many doctors joining these small group practices versus being a solo practitioner? That is a great question. Um, I think it's a big question. Um, historically, when medicine first came out and in the, the way that it's seen now, like in the 1800s when we practice medicine as it is modernly, it was more of like a, a home doc, kind of like you see on the old TV shows where they go the country doc and go to your house, check your whole family out with their little doctor bag, go home. They get paid and money and chickens, whatever. As medicine has grown, a lot of those doctors who are older had got their own practices. It was easier to purchase. There weren't a lot. Of, there weren't insurance regulations and things like there are now. Older doctors don't even have to be board certified. They're grandfathered in. They don't have to take exams. Um, so there's a lot of things that are historically like old mom and pop shop um, doctor's offices. So as time grew, the hospital systems and the insurance companies and all the hierarchies came together and they decided to buy out a lot of those. And then over time, there are less private owned practices. Even now they're being kind of like swallowed up by hospital systems because it's very hard to sustain it with the certain patient population. Like I mentioned that you might have to have thousands and thousands of patients to pay your staff, your nurses, your front desk, keep it running. And then you have to have somebody as backup so you can kind of like go on vacation and things like that. It's very hard to run as a solo doctor. So a lot of people go and they join the hospital owned practices. But now there's a revolution, like I was mentioning with a lot of people who are trying to take back ownership. Um, it actually was discouraged. They're like, oh no, don't go into private practice like when I was in residency and, and the people who trained me. So at least for the past 20 years, like they told us not to do that, it's unsustainable. But now there is a revolution where people are kind of taking back medicine and trying to give back to the patients, give them more time, give them less hierarchy with the denials from insurance and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So they're doing the DTC. So that reminds me of a company like um, a WellMed that started out just as a physician's group. Mm -hmm. And now they've um, went into rehab and and. Uh, psychology and then they've moved into hospice and so their goal is to be your provider from birth to death mm -hmm. and they're just a group right mm -hmm. so um how do you think this helps patients um or hurts minority clients and people getting into the medical profession. I could write a book about that. Black people are already at a disadvantage entering medicine just because of the debt burden. The average cost um, of debt that a person leaves medical school with is two hundred thousand dollars. I think from my friends, that was that's just the average fifty percent mean. From my friends who left medical school, I think most of us left with like at least four to $600,000 in debt in addition to college. So with that kind of debt burden, you're not gonna run out and get a, a loan to open a practice. Um, and that's why a lot of people will join different um, groups where they will pay back your loans. Like a lot of Kaiser will give a large kind of, um, 
kind of award where you get a signing bonus and they keep you for a certain amount of years and they pay down your loans. I did something called the National Health Service Corps where where you give a couple of years and they pay you per year for you working at an underserved community clinic. So there are different ways in which you can combat that and different scholarships and things like that. But it definitely has hindered, I think, a lot of minorities entering medicine. Another thing that we kind of rushed past in terms of when I was talking about my book chapter in medicine women was the racism in medicine. Racism is everywhere, mm -hmm. but there have been studies. There was one that recently came out that showed that black students and residents don't graduate more than uh, white students, there are more barriers. And it's not because they aren't smart, it's because if they fail a test, they are more likely to be um, kicked out as opposed to some a white student getting in another chance to take the test. Mm -hmm. um, they are reprimanded harder for different things. There are different files put on them, um, grievances for different things. If people, with cultural different things, when people are um, communicating, they may come off as aggressive or an angry Black woman when they're just advocating for themselves. So me personally, I, I was told recently as an attending, like, I should smile more in meetings. I'm like, am I supposed to just walk around like, geez? <laughs> Is anybody else here in the room doing that? So, so there are definitely um, biases out there, aggressions, microaggressions that can definitely hinder people from graduating. Personally, when I entered medical school, there were 15 of us. That was a large class for us uh, um, of black students who were at a medical school that wasn't at a historically black college. And three of us graduated on time out of that 15. Do you remember so the, there's a, a large problem of, like I say, there are a lot of us getting in, but we have to work on getting them out. So, my question, because you you went to Hampton University, mm -hmm. and recently, and this has been um, this has crossed crossed my my purview for about a year now. People have been downplaying the importance of HBCUs. How important is it? How important was it for you to be a student and a graduate from Howard University? So I will start correcting you. Captain, I'm sorry. I would never. <laughs> Captain, I would I'm never sorry. My brain went out. So it's, a, it's all in love for the listeners out there who may have gone to Howard, like HBCU love, but I would never go <laughs> to Howard. Can't but, allow that. Can't allow that slip up. <laughs> yes. Right. But um, personally, and this is a personal opinion, I think that it was very important and very instrumental in me going to an HBCU. I would strongly encourage anyone to go to one. Whether or not you're black or not, there we had a lot of uh, white people <laughs> at, at our HBCU, and um, a lot of them were on the tennis team. But <laughs> Going for free. <laughs> but yeah, like it, it's it's a moment, it's a movement, it's an education for life. I felt so supported. I um, it's probably the reason I got into medical school. We know that people who take standardized exams. who are of color typically don't perform as well as their white counterparts. Um, so I did an early medical school selection program that didn't really require that MCAT at that time. Um, I was able to give my confidence. I was able to, even though I was already confident, but you know, it grew into adulthood. It, um, I was able to do leadership programs that have impacted the way that I lead now. I was able to work with some of the smartest professors who were there to encourage me and work with wonderful students who are also there to encourage me. And then I also, when I matriculated into my medical school, which was predominantly white, I noticed a stark difference. 
the the professors didn't have that desire to push you or even know who you were. It's kind of more of like a numbers game. Um, I I just didn't feel like I belonged. I will say um, at a majority school, and it was a complete different experience at HBCU. I would recommend that everyone go to one, but not Howard. I have a lot of friends from Howard, so I'm definitely going to share this episode when it comes out. (laughs) And they're going to have something to say about it. Um, You you touched on sort of like um, getting in and then getting out. Is there like still like a huge gap between you know, foreign students, minorities getting into medical school and then and then graduation rates are is there still like a huge gap for that? There's definitely a huge gap. And then um also I, I was gonna go back to this. You you talked about um the cost. So for students that are in now, like because sometimes people don't know where to go. Like they don't know where to go to get scholarships, to find grants, to find help on, on paying for that. I'm, are there things that you um, suggest to young people or people getting into medical school to to constantly be checking out and the ways that they can help themselves? I mean, we keep talking about advocating, but like, yes. uh, are there are there things that you do specifically for, as terms as mentorship even, even to, to help them find that resources? There are so many resources out there. Number one, I would recommend that everyone who's interested in joining a medical school um, join the Student National Medical Association. They're an association for medical students of color. They have so much mentorship, so many different ways that you can impact the community, even now, and grow in your leadership. I've been... um, involved in the SNMA since I was a medical student. They have a pre-med um, wing. Um, so if you look on their website, snma.org, you can find all of the information. It's an offshoot of the National Medical Association, which is an organization for um, physicians of color, Black physicians, which was founded in the 1800s when Black physicians were not allowed to join the American Medical Association. So there is a lot of advocacy for the Black community, as well as helping to uplift Black students and keep them in um, in school, getting through it, helping them connect with other students who have been through it. I did post in our chat another scholarship called The Pulse of Perseverance. It's the Pulse of P3.com is by a group of Black men who are all physicians who joined together as friends and they've stayed over time. They created a book. They were on like Good America and stuff. But one of them was on my show. They have a scholarship that comes out monthly to help students in med school. There, I would also recommend that students also look into some of the schools who are now offering free tuition. This is a new thing. Um, There are a couple of schools popping up. I know one of them um, is NYU, I believe. Um, So just look up a whole bunch of different schools. They have them listed on the AAMC, American Association of Medical Colleges. I would also look into different programs of mentorship. Uh, My podcast is owned. I I don't work with the um, advising and coaching through that program through my podcast, but it's owned by Med School Coach. They do a lot of coaching in terms of how to do your application and from step to the end to the, the, the beginning to the end. And they can help you kind of navigate where to find scholarships and things. But there's a lot out there. But I would definitely start with the SNMA because um, they have a lot of information and then a lot of the local medical associations. So when I was in medical school, I went to the medical school in Massachusetts. So the Massachusetts Medical Society, I became involved in that. They, in applied to their scholarship, they gave me some pretty hefty money. So just look into those. Sometimes we talk a lot about, you know, self-care and stuff. I'm just curious, like with all the stuff that that you do, I mean, you're very busy. What what are some stuff that you do to to take care of yourself, you know, to, to, you know, 
Invest in yourself even. I think that self-care is important. I, I definitely am a firm believer in that. In the very basics, I... I love pampering myself. So I I love going to get massages. I love going on vacation. Of course, things are opening up a little more. I hadn't really been on many vacations since the pandemic, but 2022 is going to be a, the end of it is going to be a beach year for me. <laughs> so if you guys like beaches, that's cool. I love meeting with friends and going to brunch and and just had sometimes taking a mental health day. It's, it's okay. In medicine, they train you to put everyone first. But you cannot care for others unless you care for yourself. Otherwise, in terms of kind of putting yourself first in, in, in mental health, it's okay to have pivots. I will definitely say that. As we talked about, I thought when I first started working in medicine that I would work at an underserved clinic in an inner city for the rest of my life for 30 years but things changed and they changed quickly so after about three or four years of that I was like what's next it's okay to pivot so for my my the stress that I was having like I said of, of not being able to help those patients was alleviated by me figuring out different ways to impact patients so it's more than one way to skin a cat so I transitioned into another field and now last year I decided to take a sabbatical. So I took eight months off of work and I came back refreshed. So it's it's always something that you can do for yourself. And if you feel like something isn't right, it's okay to take a break, take a step back, talk to someone else, and then also try to work and live for yourself. Like a lot of times in medicine, it's ingrained to work, 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 work. If you're not working, you're lazy. So it's okay to to want to do something different. When I decided to do telemedicine, everyone was like, that means you're not a real doctor. And I'm like, my degree says differently, number one. <laughs> and number two, you can't care for patients. And now we've seen how much has grown and now people are hearing it over the past couple of years. So so don't be afraid to take a leap. You know, um, as far as... Um medical school goes are there like pros and cons of, of going like overseas or like across the border um you know either in mexico canada and europe um to get like a medical degree so so there are pros and cons definitely um pros you you may get a medical degree some of the cons is it for people who want to come back home there may be difficulties in gaining a residency because we we definitely didn't talk about the whole process of becoming a doctor. But once you get into medical school and you do your fourth year, there's something called the match, which is kind of like the MBA draft. Like your choice isn't really your own. So you interview at all of these different places and you submit a rank list, they submit a rank list, and then there's something called match day where you all open your envelope at noon on like St. Patrick's Day and find out where you're going. So a lot of people get their first choice. A lot of people get their second choice. Some people end up matching into fields like that they didn't want to go into. They may have wanted to be an emergency room doctor and they became a family medicine doctor. That was a spot that was open. So it's very difficult and it's an emotional day. Um, but matching is not guaranteed. Um, there is, I don't want to give numbers. I But I think it's like a 93% match rate for American grads, which means that thousands of people have gotten all of that medical school debt and they leave with no job. One of my friends tried to match for like seven years, um, but that's U.S. grads. So if you come in with a, a grad, an application from somewhere else, it will be more difficult to match into residency to get a job. And you have to do residency because if you graduate from medical school, yes, you're a doctor, but without residency, 
you aren't able to sit for your board certification and a lot of people um, won't hire you. The Supreme Court just recently um, set back precedents. I don't want to say they overturned Roe versus Wade because they didn't. They just sent it back to the states. Mm -hmm. But states are crazy. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Texas. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So what are, what are your thoughts about um, the Roe versus Wade decision and the difficulty in not having the uniformity of care across the United States? Okay. So I'm going to go, I'm going to answer that, but I want to add two more things to my last statement because they came to me. If you are coming from a foreign medical school, don't be discouraged. I have a many friends who have a lot of the caribbean schools are awesome um sometimes they they cost more um so it would be good if you got out and got a job but and then also uh the medical school in cuba is amazing innovative like world star but it's still that whole if you want to come back to the u.s but cuba's medical school is very thorough and, and i think they're long but going back to wait, doctor, I'm sorry, sorry mm -hmm. to cut you. I want to I want to continue with that a little bit longer. Uh huh. What do you think? Because you know, when it comes to I'm a, I'm a therapist, so mm -hmm. in New York State they talk about you must go to the accredited schools. There's only seven accredited. Yes, there's other schools, but seven accredited. Mm -hmm. Do you think overseas, Europe, Mexico, do they hold quote unquote weight and caliber mm -hmm. to get to your point? I think you said matching, or mm -hmm. do you think that these hold weight when it comes to rank to their U.S. Uh, counterparts when getting so, a job here for yes. minorities? So they 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 are oh, the schools that people should apply to should be accredited. A lot of them have like, especially in the Caribbean, they'll have like partnerships with the U.S. where they'll do their first two years of training here. And then their last two years of clinicals in the U.S., it may be more difficult because the patients have the students have to find their own people to shadow for different rotations. So it's another stressor, um, whereas at some of the more traditional MD and DO schools in the continental U.S., it's, it's a little different. Um, but I, I will I will say it will be more difficult to match because they're going to they are going to prioritize people who graduated in U.S. schools. But not impossible, but it will be more difficult. So that's the pro and the con. The pro is like you get in, you do your thing, but the con might be on the back end to yeah. continue and get back the money and how much time it takes to land. Got you. Do you yeah. think there's a difference in educational, I guess, competency? And I don't know. It's like, do you think like they're, they're, comp they're um, what's the word? Not competitive, comparable? Sorry, it's being going. I would say if you're applying, if you're in a school and you're coming to apply to graduate, like, you know, to matriculate to a residency in the U.S., you're required to take the USMLE, which is one of the licensing exams. You have to take two of them before you graduate, well, three of them, before you graduate medical school. So step one and then step two has two parts. And then when you get into residency, you'll take step three and then your boards. So in order... I would say that you're learning most of the information because you have to all be able to take that same exam. So, because I, I always find that so strange about America, only because we have the worst health outcomes than almost any industrialized country in the world. So, that, Especially with maternal mortality, like you, yeah. the the Roe v. Wade, we yeah. have some work to do. I feel as though the decision that was made was tremendously disappointing. Um, it has set us back hundreds of years. Um, people will die because of those decisions, and 
they're going to have to figure out a way to to make it change. They're going to have to figure out a way for women to gain autonomy over their bodies. They're have to gonna gonna have to figure out a way for women to stay safe. They're gonna have to figure out a way for us to have access to care because if people are leaving the states where it's quote unquote banned or whatever, legally banned, they're either gonna get backdoor abortions or you're going to lose lives because women are having miscarriages or ectopic pregnancies and things like that. One of my friends, um, had an issue last year when she was pregnant and she had preeclampsia and they had to decide whether or not she would live or get rid of. So if this had, she had lived in Texas or something, and this had been six months later than when it happened, she wouldn't be here today. So, so there, there are always issues. And even if someone just wants to get an abortion, like it should be their personal decision. It has nothing to do with me, nothing to do with you. It's between them and their doctor. Um, I, I do, I'm very concerned about the future of what's going to go on. Like we said, we've seen how the mortality rates in women, period, are high in childbirth. That's why back in the day, everyone, all the kings and stuff, if you learn history, they'll be like, mom died in childbirth. Because childbirth is dangerous. Like that's why we have modern medicine. So, so we're we're gonna have to figure out ways to move forward. There, there are, there is still accessibility to um, medical abortions, which are the the abortion pill. Um, a lot of the telemedicine, a lot of the telemedicine for women's health organizations are able to ship that to women, but everyone doesn't qualify for that, depending on your situation. So some people, and then sometimes even if you do take that pill, it sometimes it, it, it's a really good pill, but sometimes it doesn't work and you have to have a procedure after that. So there are so many things that have come as a result of people who are not in medicine making decisions uh, legally about what should be done. So, so um, number one, we're going to have to have people advocate. We're going to have to do all the things that people should be doing, vote, all of that kind of stuff, especially because this is a midterm elections year. But we're also going to have to figure out ways to reach out and support these organizations who are standing up for women and also figure out how to speak more openly about what is going on in each other's lives because a lot of times women haven't shared that they've had a miscarriage or haven't shared this and then you hear it and there's all these people in the room if you have these shared experiences it shouldn't be taboo so just like we're talking about racism and we talked about that used to be taboo don't talk about talk about these other things that are going on in your life so you can figure out how to get a support system and how to move forward so how does that look for um minority and, and black women specifically? More people are gonna die. The people who are gonna suffer the most are people who are underserved, uninsured, who have these healthcare disparities. Most of the time, that's the majority of black women. We've already seen that our maturity, maternity mortality rates are about three times the rate of white women right now. We've seen how people like Serena Williams, who has all of that money, almost died because people didn't advocate and believe for her pain when she was having her daughter and she actually had blood clots in her lungs and nobody believed her. So if she can't advocate for herself or have someone say, go give her this, like what, what are people who don't have money, who have their kids at home, who don't have insurance, who can't travel hours to get somewhere. You see how big Texas is like, to have that man, Oklahoma, like to have that man with those massive states, how long are you gonna drive to go and get something? You don't give people time off. You don't give them maternity leave. You don't give them miscarriage leave. You don't give them paid anything. A lot of these companies are coming for it now where they're saying they'll pay you for- Like getting, travel expenses. And travel stuff. expenses and things. We have to ask these organizations, yes, thank you for that. But what else are you going to do? Are you still going to continue to donate 
to these politicians who are making these laws or are you going to take your money back? So, so we have to push and we have to advocate and continue to do it. And we have to call out people who aren't doing anything. Because when I think about that, I've, I'm always haunted by a picture from a, a, a New York um a New York newspaper that showed a woman who died from uh, illegal abortion. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you think it's going to take? We have so many um, voices in our ear about how black people our, our vote doesn't matter and you have so many voices in our ear about um how it doesn't um how we can't change anything in this country how do you give these i'm trying to figure out a way especially with health care because the disparities are so great. How do we push our push that agenda forward and get the people in the community to understand that this is important? That's a great question. I think that you're doing your part by, by having conversations like this and reaching a broad audience. We, we definitely have to work with organizations that have similar beliefs and have done things to move the efforts forward. We, we have to study what happened in the past because the past history repeats itself. So nothing's new under the sun. So we have to take notes from what happened in the women's suffrage and the civil rights movement, what organizations were alive, which ones are, are, supposedly advocating for us now. We have to figure out how to influence other people to use their voice like we were talking about in terms of allies because to be honest and transparent, we did our part in 2020 as black women. Black men did not do their part. White women did not do their part. That 53%. So now we see where we are because voting has consequences. So now we're in this place and we have to come together to pull ourselves up and figure out how we can encourage everyone to advocate for change. And we have to not be discouraged because it seems bleak, because it seems like every day there's a new law that's coming out from the Supreme Court. like. How can you on one day say that states don't have the decision to create laws about guns, but then they have the decision to create the laws about abortions? Like, and, and it's not just an abortion issue. So it's a right to human rights and to human health and to privacy because no one should even know what's going on between a woman and her doctor. So, and as they've said in these documentations, they're going to move for other stuff. So if it isn't something that's affecting you now, like some people may say, like, I don't care about abortions. I don't need one. Or I don't know anybody that's ever got one. Or if I get pregnant, I'm going to just have, it. like, there may be lots of different conversations and different emotions and different feelings. But if they're not coming for you today, they're coming for you tomorrow in a different way. So, so we just have to figure out how we as a society can remain civilized because we're, we're going down. <laughs> so so we, we definitely have to work together and, and figure out how we can utilize groups and utilize the marches and utilize the voting and all of the different avenues because it's not going to just be one way that's going to create the change. I always keep telling people you are one amendment away from picking cotton. If you think they're just going after women right now, just hold on a second. Mm -hmm. You know? And I'm I'm kind of at my 
kind of at my wits end because this is something that's kind of been ingrained in me since I was a kid. You're one amendment away. You're one, pay attention. You're one amendment away. Pay attention. And I know that's not the life that everybody grows up with. And it's very hard to, um, it's very hard to, um, expound on the importance of voting and making your voice heard when so often we are silenced. I agree because we talk and I'm sure you guys have heard in the news and all these podcasts and all of these different things that you listen to. Everyone is talking about the social determinants of health, like how different parts of your life intersect and create your healthy body. Like your environment, where you live, what schools you go to, the education will give you the certain jobs that you can get. If you feel like you're in a safe neighborhood, can you walk around and lose weight and things like that? Or will you be afraid that you may be shot? Do you have access to the health care? Do you have all of these different things? But what a lot of people don't talk about is the political determinants of health. Like health care is a human right, but we, we have to vote in order to create these laws and elect these people that impact your health. So we can talk about until we're blue in the face about decreasing the rates of maternal mortality and how we want to decrease the rate of medication costs and how we want to have everyone be able to get a visit with their doctor within a week and how we want one hour visits. And we want, we can tell everything we want, but unless we have lawmakers that are setting these things in place, they're only going to set us backwards. So, so we have to advocate for these changes. And I think that all goes back to education, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, there's such a, I don't call it a gap, it's not a gap. If there's just not enough education in even just politics alone with, with anybody, like, you know, we, we grow up just being told how things are supposed to be. And that's how you take it. You just, you just move with it. So like, like I could see like, um, you know, and we talk as well as healthcare and stuff like where people can go to get that education. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree with that because if you don't know, and if you keep seeing these outcomes, like if someone's like, I voted, this still happened. Why should I vote again? My vote doesn't matter. It does, like as we've seen, like with the mobilization in Georgia with Stacey Abrams, like we need 50 of those, one in every state. Like we should clone Stacey and do what she did. But since we can't do that, we have to figure out other ways and how to mobilize those programs because we have to educate people about the judicial process, election process, all of politics, because it is essential to life. We learn about all of these things, algebra, calculus, like, no shade, like, I haven't had to do an equation since, like, high school or college, but I got to figure out my taxes, and I got to figure out how to vote and how to look up what each position means. So we need to figure out ways to make things accessible and at a, a stage where people want to engage with them because we keep talking about it and every year we're like this is the election of our lives people are going to show now they're like every election is the year the election of your life yes it is so so we have to figure out a way to make political education and engagement more engaging it is one thing that i admire about the newer generation the Zoomers or whatever they want to be called, because they they have been through a lot. They've been through COVID. They've been through the virtual school. They've done, but they have social media and they use it. These kids are standing up for their rights. Like the kids, I forgot which tragedy. It's terrible that there are so many Parkland. school shootings. Yeah, <laughs> it's terrible that there are so many school shootings and I can't even remember the names. But Parkland. Parkland, the Parkland kids are like creating a revolution and trying to advocate for themselves and create change. So so we need to look to that younger generation and partner with them and then partner with our elders who have been through like the civil rights and all of that and figure out how we can merge all of those things and move forward and create a new way to advocate for ourselves. The vaccine and booster. 
use to fight that. Uh, re reportedly, that, that was done by a Black woman. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think that helps or even hurts Black women in the field of medicine and science, especially with all of the even the pol the politics around COVID itself. Mm -hmm. I think that is very disappointing that we politicized public health emergencies. Um, but we we have um, Kismis Kismis. I don't know how to say her first name. Corbett. Dr. Corbett uh, helped with the Moderna vaccine and she's awesome. I haven't met her, one day I hope to. I think that it, it definitely helped encourage people. I think the bigger issue is, like we said, we politicize the public health emergency. We, if the, two, three years ago, if there was a measles break at Disneyland, like there was, you like, okay, go vaccinate your kids. But now it's like a, a dirty word. Um, if in order to get into schools, like people needed to be vaccinated. And now that people are moving in a different way, I think that there was a failure at the government's level in order to educate people in a manner in which it would have been easily digestible in order to understand what the vaccine was and why. Like, um, I feel like we should have had more PSAs on the TV every day and the radio explaining like the myths and the, the distrust, but it became such a large thing that now it is left versus right and vaxxers versus non-vaxxers or maskers versus non-maskers and it shouldn't be, but Hopefully, as the year moves on, we'll figure out something. But we're in year three. I never thought we would get to that. Um, we'll see where year three takes us. That's all I can say. So as somebody who's been watching this um, epidemic since November of 2019, mm -hmm. when it was in Wuhan, Mm -hmm. I, I I would read the posts from the doctors in Wuhan and they were talking about it. They were prosecuted, but mm -hmm. they were trying to get the word out even back then. Um, elections have consequences. And when you elect the idiot, you get idiotic results. Mm -hmm. As we can see, mm -hmm. um, we are in this left versus right battle, but who got their shot and their booster? Trump did. Yeah. So he's telling you not to get it and he got it. So enough said. <laughs> <laughs> and now there's so much misinformation in the world. Um, especially behind this vaccine. Um, and I don't know if nobody ever read the side effects for the MMR, but every medication you have ever taken in the world has side effects. Um, and not everybody's going to experience those side effects, but they, I, I think the, the lack of education on how the research works also had a big impact on people because not everybody knows that if you, if one person has the side effect, it's listed as a side effect, even if it's only one person, mm -hmm. there has to be, Come, become a way to have um, because of the lack of education in the United States and let's just keep it a buck we are what number 25 in education of all western civilizations 
which is pathetic how much especially considering how much we spend just on um higher learning how do we get past the ignorance level the ignorance level is and i th- the ignorance level is out of control so just speaking with our community how do we get them past this nobody loves me everybody hates me mentality to understand the real science and 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 the real goals of curbing this pandemic that's a great question i think if if we come together and we come up with a solution we might like win a lot of money but um i i i think that we we started at a disadvantage because we were this is the first global pandemic that we've had in my lifetime i think right before i was born the aids epidemic had started initially so that was the last time that we you know had a a great global meet like this and before that you know once in a lifetime type thing we we had the 1918 flu pandemic that this is modeled after. So a lot of time, I think that the way that we communicate in this modern age has kind of hurt and hindered us because we were at a time, especially when the pandemic first started, where we were watching science in action. Anybody who has ever done a science fair in like the fourth or fifth grade knows that you're looking at the scientific method and you gotta do some different trials and then you wanna come to the results and see if they work. So we were seeing that in action at a grand scale globally. So of course there were gonna be some errors as they tried to figure out what was going on. But the problem was that that was happening kind of on live TV every day And then there were people on one side saying the absolute best things, people on the other side saying the absolute worst things, and then people in the middle trying to say what they do. So outside of that, we had, we have other things to kind of potentiate that where you have social media and people are allowed to spread false narratives. And then we have people who can Google and they want to Google every different ingredient that they've ever read when we don't do that like you said for Tylenol we don't do that for the orange soda that may be in your refrigerator like everything does have a side effect and everything has strange ingredients you don't do that for the weight loss medicines you're trying to take uh, the the nutrition supplements so they were lo- really scrutinizing what was going on and then on top of that we had the distrust of the community So we had the, um, you know, people thinking that they're being experimented on. So as we've grown in this year two, people of having the vaccine, people are seeing like, okay, so-and-so got it, they're still alive. Like they didn't grow an extra thumb or, or something on their forehead, maybe I should get it. Or they're making me get it because I gotta go back to work or I I need to do this and this. So there are so many reasons that people are starting to get it or they want to travel or they want to do this. So hopefully that will grow more and more. But I think we're at a point where we can utilize the social media to do more campaigns for educating. There is a website called greaterthancovid.org that has a lot of questions about what's going on for those people who may still be on the fence. I think we're at a point where where COVID is becoming endemic and it is changing just like a lot of other viruses do, but this one is is more intense. And if you're not vaccinated, like unfortunately people have lost, like millions of people have died. So like you, you have to look into the pros and cons and then also look into what else has been in your body. Like 
hopefully you have received all of your childhood vaccinations when you're pregnant you have to receive a new tetanus shot and a pertussis shot and all of those types of things you hopefully get the flu vaccine so how is this different than that and then you have to take a step back and also look at if someone's trying to hurt you why are they taking it too? trump has it biden has it i have it I, i'm like shoot me in the face like when do i need to get my other one apparently we're about to start getting them maybe seasonally because i know that they're trying to come up with a new one for the fall but science works for a reason so you should probably listen to the epidemiologists and the sciences about how the process works because i'm not a mechanic so i'm not gonna go and tell anybody like how to fix my rotors and change my engine i'm gonna go to the specialist just like when you go to the doctor for your heart you go to the cardiologist to help you with your heart. You may not understand everything they're saying, so you can ask them to explain it in a different way that's more digestible or ask for resources for extra learning. But you shouldn't go toe to toe, toe about like, oh, methyl, ethylene, crocolone. Like, what does that mean? Like, come on. So I, to, long story short, outside of my rant, I think that we are progressing. We are a lot further than when the vaccine first came out. A lot of people are getting it for various reasons, but we do have a ways to go and we just have to come together as a community and learn how one person can affect other people and not be selfish because just because you're fine and you just had the COVID and it feels like the flu and you want, or not the flu or a little virus or a cold, you wanna go out and expose everyone. Think about those people who are out there who may have immunodeficiencies or grandparents and things like that. You want to respect people's space and also kind of help your other brethren. You asked a quick question. I'm sorry, you guys, sorry. Ugh, we're going to have to edit that. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I have a quick question here because you did say that, and I want to make sure I heard this correctly. You said we're going to have a new booster. Is it going to be something different than what we've had? Because from what I see, it seems like we've been having the same shot over and over and over. But again, I'm again, I'm, I'm the guy, right? I don't know about fixing rooters and whatever. I don't know anything about this. So yeah. are we going to have allegedly a new shot coming in, whatever? It's going to be different? Allegedly, right? we are. I don't quote me. But I've been seeing a lot of reports that they're working on another vaccine to come out in the fall that will better attack Omicron, the variant that is more prevalent now that's kind of getting everybody. I personally, full disclosure, have been very protective over those past three years, especially the first two, and I avoided COVID this whole time, and I've been boosted in things, and, and I got COVID um, in April. Um, I'm doing well. I'm thankful for my shot and my booster. A lot of people may ask questions as to, and I hear this a lot, like you got COVID and you had the vaccine. Why should I get it? Yes. The intentions, if people would read the original papers, um, <laughs> scientifically, the original thought process for the vaccine and for the intention was never to prevent you from getting COVID. They thought that it could decrease your risk, which it has for a lot of people. But the, the point was to decrease the rate of death. So you, yeah, it's working for us. <laughs> Let's just say that. A lot of people are getting Omicron, but people aren't dying at the rate they were in 2020 without the vaccine. Yeah, I always think of it as like, uh, like supplemental. Like, mm -hmm. like it's not, it's not a cure. It's, it's a, it's something just to help, just to help. Yes. So, and I, and, and that's goes along with that education thing that people just don't, they don't, they don't know. Yeah. I always think of it as the flu vaccine. So over the years and people probably don't even know, but the flu vaccine has changed multiple times over the years. Mm -hmm. It's been um, changed to incorporate the swine flu. It's been changed <laughs> to incorporate 
different variants of flu as the variants pop up because viruses are smart. They mutate. They understand. And, and just like any other living organism, self-preservation is important. So they will mutate and they will find a way to survive and we have to keep attacking the new strain. Absolutely. Unfortunately, we can't attack the new strain until the new strain is here. Mm -hmm. So we're always going to be behind the goalposts. However, if we can keep people from dying, that is our ultimate goal. And I don't think people really understand that. They think um, that it's a conspiracy for population control. And if they want, and I always say, if they wanted to control the population, they just wouldn't have did nothing because you were dying anyway. Absolutely. And we (laughs) don't know the effect of. People are just saying that they're getting COVID and it's just mild because, you know, it's mutating, like you said, but you don't know the effect that it's having on your internal organs. So one of my friends is a pathologist, and especially when COVID had first came out, there were a lot of bodies that she had to evaluate who were asymptomatic. She, they didn't even know they had COVID. They died from other reasons. And when she would examine them, you could see the COVID in all area, like lungs, liver, things that you wouldn't even think about. So mm-hmm. it's best to prevent getting that if you can um, by masking, getting the boosters to avoid it as much as you can, social distancing, doing things outside because it's the summer. And um, then also a lot of people are like, okay, I've already had it. I'm good. But you, you don't want to keep getting it. Yeah. Exactly. those long haul Mhm. Absolutely. And I, I, I have a friend right now who got COVID last year, and she still can't smell or taste. Mm-hmm. So that's a thing in itself. Yes. Where do you see the medical field going, like five to ten years from now? You know, and from like health insurance and coverage and uh, benefits, affordability, all that stuff. That's a wonderful question. If I had a magic crystal ball, I I have two answers, honestly, because if you had asked me this maybe like a month ago before like the Supreme Court stuff was leaked and now that it's active, I would have probably had a completely different answer than now. I think that we are going to spend the next couple of years trying to restore things in healthcare that are being broken down. Um, But (laughs) if things go the way that we hope and we are able to advocate and create change, I would hope that there would be more integration as there is right now of healthcare tech, where we are able to utilize the technology that we had to incorporate health into our lives. So we see a lot of apps where people are trying to do new diets and stay abreast with drinking water and trying to monitor their blood pressure and their weight and all of these different things. I think that as we have more wearable devices and we're able to incorporate more health things, people will have healthier lives. There was the big push for a lot of people to have workout materials in their home and do the the TV things and the Pelotons and all of those kinds of stuff. So hopefully they will create things that are more affordable for everyone because there are barriers to that so that people can incorporate health and move more. I would hope in terms of when you asked about insurance and all of those kinds of things like I just hope in the next 10 years, we join the rest of the civilized world and have some form of universal health care. No health care system is perfect in the world, but they all have their pluses and minuses. And I'm sure that we will still need some form of privatized medicine. Um, But I think that everyone should have a basic level of accessibility to care and not have to go bankrupt to live 
I feel like healthcare is a human right so that we should be able to implement that for people and allow them to not have to worry about selling their house in order to get dialysis or things like that, that, that kind of help people. And hopefully with more funding, I hope that they fund more primary care so that we can do more prevention so people won't need dialysis. We can catch things early when they come for their quote unquote physical. Um, <laughs> we do that blood work. And then I, I hope that they add also more funding for graduate medical education, because as we talked about earlier, we want to increase the number of people who have cultural competence in healthcare. We want to keep those students who are in school, in school and get them out. And we want them to be able to match into a qualified residency program so that they can go and serve our country. And the reason that everyone doesn't match is not for grades and things like that. It's because the government doesn't fund residency programs with graduate medical education. So we have to advocate to our states to create more funding for residencies. They are creating more funding for medical schools. So medical schools are popping up all across America. But when these students graduate, they have nowhere to go. So we need to create residency funding. What about in lifestyle? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, how do you, where do you, or where do you hope to see that, you know, as to being that being one of your. Yeah. So that kind of goes up hand in hand with what I was talking about earlier about having more accessibility for creating avenues for exercise and not having it be so cost prohibitive where people can't afford to get a Peloton or can't afford to go to the gym or things like that. Also incorporating more nutrition based things where we see that there's a lot of alternative nutrition in the grocery store now where they're having more plant based diets become more mainstream. So I, I would hope that they would educate people more about the benefits of plant based diets. I myself need to kind of practice what I preach, but there have been tons of studies that have shown that people who practice more plant-based diets live longer and it can reverse diseases. So there have been people who've had heart failure, who've had diabetes, they go completely plant-based and a few months, all gone. So, so it's revolutionary. So I think that we should incorporate that more into the mainstream and education of our patients and everybody that's a lay person, but also education in the medical system, because most medical schools only give about two weeks of nutrition education in the four years. So we need to show more people about what possibilities there are outside of just giving medications. Medications definitely have their place but we should work on also teaching people about the alternatives. So I think part of, part of the reason, part of the problem is people don't understand how mm -hmm. to shop. Yes. They don't understand that all, anything that's good for you is on the outer aisles mm -hmm. and everything that's bad for you is stuffed in the middle the part that's easily accessible because Absolutely. the vegetables is on the outside that's way the meat is on the outside the other way and everything they're going to make sure that you pass by the candies the cookies the cereals and all of that stuff mm -hmm. that's smashed in between in order to get from one end to the other Absolutely. And even with that, like if you do choose to have a snack or something like that, learning how to read food labels is fundamental. A lot of people don't understand what it means about like sodium and things. They're like, I'm not using salt. And then when you look in their meals, they have all of the sodium. So educating people about that, as well as also teaching them different ways because people may say, I don't want to eat plant-based because it's nasty, but like you can season stuff and like teaching them those things. With the economic crisis that is going on now, right? Or the mm -hmm. possible economic crisis, right? Like you said, we don't have a crystal ball and inflation at our doorstep and possible housing market. Budgets and affordability are going to be an issue with mm -hmm. eating healthy, right? Vegan, 
vegetarian diets, accessibility, and poor areas tend to have like inferior supermarkets and produce. I'm just yeah. wondering how practical it's going to be in the upcoming months and upcoming years for us to make this happen. Yeah, that's a great question because I think we are at that crisis when gas is six dollars here, so not liking it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but, Will you? Where are I'm you? from in DC. Oh wow! Yeah. Amen. Yeah. yeah. So we you bring up a great point because most urban underserved areas are food deserts. When you think about it, when you're in especially inner cities, there aren't a lot of grocery stores nearby, like pre gentrification. So you where do you go? You go to the corner store. What's in there? All the crap that we SP was just talking about that's in the middle of the store is just the entire store. You're getting the sodas, you're getting the candy cookie, the, the hot sausages, all of those things, but you don't have the accessibility to have vegetables and salads or grilled meats and, and stuff like that. So there, there's definitely an access problem and an affordability problem. I think that that's something else we need to advocate because like we said, like voting is power. So there are a lot of programs in some cities where they are allowing people to have um, like food markets where every Tuesday, I know in Baltimore, we had in the inner city, like people who would come from the farms and stuff and have the foods and it would be cheaper and stuff. When I lived in Boston and I went to school, we actually gave our patients vouchers. So there were partnerships with these people who were coming out to give food where you say, okay, you have high blood pressure. Let me give you this ticket because I want you to have vegetables three times a week or something like that that you can eat. And then we were able to allow them to go to the market and use that ticket and get it for free. And they were getting some kind of compensation from that. Other ways that we can implement it is just figuring out how to shop smartly. So a lot of people, yes, all this stuff is high. But when you think about it, eating a can thing of green beans is not good because it's full of preservatives. Yes, it lasts long, but there's a lot of sodium in there that's going to cause your pressure to get higher. And you're like, I'm eating vegetables. And then you look and it's all canned food. But if you were to go and get the fresh green beans snapped out in the vegetable section, they may be a little tiny bag for $5 or something, and people can't sustain themselves off of that if they have a family of four or five. So when you think about it, you can go in the frozen section, which a lot of people kind of don't think about where a bag might be $2. There are some dollar stores where they have frozen sections and you wouldn't think like, I don't want to eat at a dollar store, but they have some frozen sections. So you can look for those little finds and kind of create a list or go on Pinterest and find ideas of things in which you can substitute or supplement and kind of get some of those nutrients in by going to the frozen section instead of the fresh section and avoiding the canned goods and also looking in terms of like farmer's markets and stuff like that. Although farmer's markets can be expensive if your doctor can give you a voucher. And if all else fails, you have, you know, go get you a, a little potted plant and a mm -hmm. 99 cent packet of seeds. Yeah. Or bucket. We use, um, we put, um, paper the the parchment paper mm -hmm. and the egg, and egg crates and filled it up with soil and 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 grew vegetables so it's, it's, you just have to learn how to be creative it's one of my goals if we ever make any money with this podcast that we will fund community gardens, gardens. oh that'd be amazing yeah and then also thinking of other stuff that you can cut back on and in, in use. So like if you cut back on getting all of the soda and all of those teas and stuff, you can get water. If you get a filter on, for your water, you can use the water from your faucet or your refrigerator or something like that. And that can help in a lot of ways. A lot of times if people cut out soda and juice alone, you lose 10, 15 pounds. So if you think about those things, the repercussions of that, 
may help decrease your blood pressure and other stuff. And then you can incorporate the smaller things like buying the frozen vegetables and and, and having smaller portions of meat if you don't want to go fully plant-based and kind of working on decreasing the amount of starches. That can make your bill go down too if you're not always buying the macaroni and cheese and all of those other things. It can also help to, to kind of decipher those kinds of things and looking for when there are sales with coupons and mm -hmm. then trying to look for different stores that have bargains like Walmart or Aldi or something. So what do you want your legacy to be? Not only as a doctor, but as a woman? That's a great question. Um, I love that you said not as a doctor because I have a firm belief that your job has nothing to do with who you are as a component of who you are, but it should never define you. So for me, I just want to be remembered as a person who cared for others and who put her best foot forward. And if things didn't work out, she was able to pivot into something else and was able to work to encourage others to figure out how to live their best lives and to kind of shine. Like I, I love shining and I want to help other people shine. And who, the name of the show is Powerful Impact. Mm -hmm. So who are the three most influential people that were important and, and made a powerful impact in your life up to this point? That's a great question. Number one, I'm going to say my mama because she was, well, she's the reason I'm here. She raised me to have great values. And if she listens to this, she probably would hurt me if I didn't say her. No, I'm just saying she is a, a very important person in my life. Number two, I would probably say one of my high school administrators, Miss Janella Moore, was like a second mother to me when I was growing up. And she encouraged me to go to Hampton. She was like, you must go to HBCU because at first I wasn't looking at them. And that definitely changed my life. And she actually passed away on my high school graduation day. So that was a very impactful person in my life. And then in reflection, she was only 30. So back when I was in high school, you know, your teachers and your administrators, are they know everything. And like, mm -hmm. so in hindsight, for her to have such an impact on so many people and to have been so wise and to only be 30 years old, is phenomenal and people still talk about her to this day. So even though she's no longer here and whew, I graduated, I guess, 18 years ago, um, she, she, um, she still has an impact on people. So I would like to have that kind of impact. And number three, I'm going to go with Stacey Abrams because I really respect what she did in 2020. And before that, like I've read her book, one of them, in which she talked about her journey from the beginning into politics and how she's still trying to do what she set out to do. I'm sure they've offered her other jobs, but she's set on being governor of Georgia. So I definitely respect someone who can come up with a plan and develop it and implement it and also work to be an advocate and a change agent and inspire other people. So she's in my top list. And right now she's running neck and neck with Kemp, 46% to 46%. So, hey, I, she gives me hope. She's she's one of those people who gives me hope. Um, before we go, would you like to give any shout outs or promote any projects or products you have coming out in the near future? Sure. So... And give us your links. Make sure you, you tell people where to get in contact with you. I'm going to put it in the description. Okay. But, but yeah, make sure you let people know where, where to harass you because they're going to ask you plenty of questions after this. Thank you. So I really appreciate coming on the show. Um, as you guys have heard a little bit about me, I love to talk. I love to engage with people. So if you have any organizations where you want to talk about how to become a change agent in healthcare, how to decrease these healthcare disparities, or even like how to have better employment, employee health and wellness, definitely reach out to me. My website is 
www.drerkeda.com, drerkeda.com. I have an Instagram, doctor spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R, the letter D, G-R-A-M, Dr. D. Graham, where I post my randomness of the day and intermix some advocacy and podcast stuff, but sometimes I have fun with reels. Don't judge me. Otherwise, I um, we talked about I have the book out already, and I have one coming out in October on telehealth, and I am expanding my uh, goals into coaching. So definitely look into my website for more information on that. It should be coming out in the next month or two. Um, like I said, I love people and I love to help people kind of find themselves and live their best lives. If you want to quit your job, we can talk about that. If you want to figure out how to advocate for your health care, we can also talk about that. And then in about six months, we may have to come back, but um, a couple of friends and I are partnering with another health organization to create a summit talking about obesity. So we want to decrease obesity in people of color, as well as people with chronic conditions. So we're going to have a lot of speakers and probably a couple of days of us talking about how to just incorporate that lifestyle medicine, obesity medicine, and how to just live healthier lives. And we might, I love the ideas that you guys talked about on how to do it on a budget. So we definitely need to incorporate that. You are incredible and amazing. And I, I am so happy you came on. It's it has been. It's going to be a blessing to our audience. It's definitely been a blessing to us. And I guarantee I'm going to be in touch with you about the obesity thing, because you know. <laughs> no, we we I I always believe in um, body positivity. So of course you're, you're wonderful. We just want to keep you healthy. So exactly, we want to keep you healthy. One of my friends says she doesn't believe in the word diet because it has dye in it. So <laughs> we want to do lifestyle changes. One of the one of the wonderful things is I don't have high blood pressure. I'm not diabetic, but I don't want it either. So you yeah. should nip it in the bud early. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. Um, everybody, I'm going to put all her information in the description. Make sure you you check her out. Go to her podcast. Follow her. Um, subscribe, check out our website, and we will see you on the flip side. Uh, like, follow, and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much. We appreciate you coming on. Uh, don't forget her Instagram, Dr. D. Graham. Make sure you check her out, and we'll see you on the flip side. Thank Peace. you. Powerful impact. Boom. Get them books. Peace.